So Fred Hutch is a cancer research center located in Seattle, Washington. What we're well known for is pioneering the bone marrow transplant, which is a curative therapy for many blood disorders. And from that, we've got to immunotherapies, which are now being used for a lot of cancers as well. But along the way, while we were discovering that, we realized that people who were being transplanted and saved from their cancer were also dying from infection. And so we recruited a bunch of infectious disease specialists uh, to that point that we launched a global HIV vaccine trials network out of Fred Hutch. And so we already had about 25% of our faculty researching viruses. And so when this pandemic came, we just switched focus from one virus to another. And to that end, we've also taken on the job of coordinating the, the five major vaccine trials that are being done by the U.S. government. We're, we've been coordinating the trials for that to make sure that we so that we can compare apples to apples. So the Hutch is, is, a, is a comprehensive cancer research center where we're looking for treatments and cures for cancer and other diseases that are affecting people around the world like HIV, malaria, um, COVID-19. And a large amount of our funding comes from the government which is great, like it provides the backbone of our research funding. But the way government funding is structured is it likes ideas that are already semi-proven and then they want to take it to completion. But those like crazy ideas, those little brilliant seeds, those aren't funded by government money. That comes from individual donors and from philanthropy, from people at Bingothan. Like you are funding the next big idea, the next thing that could cure COVID-19 or HIV, one of those things, like those brilliant seeds of ideas, that's what this is funding. We're seeing across the world right now that there's not enough vaccines to go around. For certain places in the world, it'll be later this year or maybe even into next year before they get vaccines. So along the way, we need to find sustainable treatments that are already approved that we can get out to people very quickly once they get COVID so we can reduce the severity of illness for all the people that are getting infected. Some of you may remember last year, the then President Trump got ill with COVID-19 and he received some, some, some treatments which were called monoclonal antibodies. These are treatments that basically, your body may not have antibodies yet to fight the virus, but we will give you the antibodies you need that can destroy them. There's a couple of antivirals. So viruses have a life cycle. They, they enter the cell through a certain way. They'll make copies of themselves. But the way this virus copies itself, if we can block that, we can reduce the severity of illness. And then there's other things that include treatments that can reduce how severe the immune reaction is. A lot of people are dying because the immune reaction is too severe. So if we can give this treatment to sort of damp it down just a little bit, that can also potentially save a lot of lives. You can always go to fredhutch.org to keep up with some of the research that we're, we're putting out there. You can even follow some of our researchers on Twitter or Fred Hutch on Twitter and Instagram. We do retweet a lot of the science that is going on at the Hutch and with our collaborators. So actually even going to Fred Hutch's YouTube channel, I do put up a lot of our scientific talks. I know for me personally, I read all the work that happens at Fred Hutch. I listen to a bunch of talks. I also read certain publications like um, Vox News has a very good science writer as well. And uh, STAT also has a really good science section as well. The Atlantic as well in the US also has a really good science writer as well. The more science does to be accessible, the less mistrust of science we get. There is already evidence of that happening. The number of missed screenings has been due to COVID-19 pandemic has been really high. And I think I saw a paper which suggested that now people are getting diagnosed later. So the cancer has spread further due to the fact that the early screenings and detections were missed. 
And so that effect we will be seeing for years to come. Some positives have come out of this. Like a Fred Hush researcher has been uh, really pushing for this test for colorectal cancer. It's called the FIT test. And for colorectal cancer screenings, it just involves mailing um, something to somebody's house, them taking a sample and mailing it back and using that for diagnosis. And so changing how we think about how we diagnose people will be really important going forward. Hopefully this will lead to some flexibility and some new ideas and new technologies that can improve screening even remotely. I think the, the answer is that we don't know. We haven't been able to test this mix and match strategy. It's possible that it would be good because there is this thing in the immune in the vaccine world that's called like heterologous prime boost, where occasionally if you give one type of vaccine and then do another, you can actually see an effect that is ab over and above both of them. But those have been done in like properly tested scenarios. That is not the case here. I think the case here is that we don't actually know whether you can mix and match. In the absence of knowledge, I would definitely recommend sticking to trying to get the second dose of whatever you got from the first dose. And for things like AstraZeneca, actually, when the UK did the first dose and the delayed second dose, they even found that a delayed second dose even helps the efficiency of the, the vaccine to fight disease. So you can push it out beyond the three or four week window and it should be okay. The big research that is flying under the radar that I am super blown away by is the research on the microbiome. So the microbiome is are the bacteria and viruses that live on our bodies and in our bodies. Believe it or not, there are as many cells that are bacteria and viruses on your body and in your body as there are cells that are you. So 50% of you is bacteria and viruses and 50% of you is you. There's a thought that the, the microbiome in your gut can break down certain foods and get rid of certain things that would lead to cancer. So having a good gut microbiome can reduce your colon cancer risk because there are some bacteria that will take all the food that's bad for you or could lead to cancer and just like break it down and it's never present. And your gut is also where your body learns what is friendly and what is unfriendly. So your immune system is really shaped by your microbiome. And so the, the possibilities are endless with the microbiome. mRNA vaccines were being trialed for HIV even before COVID came along. But the speed at which things were developed for COVID-19 will really have a huge impact on HIV because HIV changes and mutates far more frequently than um, COVID-19 does. But the scale to which we were able to make these mRNA vaccines so quickly, the, the sequence for the virus landed in somebody's inbox on January 10th. By February, we were already making that mRNA vaccine. So that speed and technology, that adaptability, is going to be crucial for somebody with HIV, where the va virus is constantly evolving so quickly. mRNA vaccines could be the future for cancer treatment as well. If you think about it, we, it could be getting to that world of personalized cancer treatment, where you understand, oh, the surface of this person's cancer has this unique element that is not present anywhere else in their body. Let's make a vaccine to that and train the immune system to recognize that and destroy it because all you have to do is print out an mRNA fragment, and now we know how to make it. It is more likely than not that we will need a booster at some point in time. It depends on two different factors, right? So right now we have data for six months on how long people have protection. We don't know about nine months, we don't know about a year because well, we haven't tested the vaccines that long. So once we figure that out, maybe that will shape when we get the boosters. And the second is the variants. As the virus faces an immune system that has learned to recognize it, 
will there be new variants that show up? Will there be new mutations that happen in response to people getting vaccinated, uh, leading to a variant that will be able to escape vaccination? And then we'll need to get a new shot out for it. One of the ways that we get variants is that there's uncontrolled spread of the virus. And that's why it's really important to, to bring that down while we're still vaccinating to reduce that probability that we're getting more and more variants showing up. We don't know the answer, but we will shortly. So Fred Hutch is also helping lead a trial called COVID-U, where we are working with the US government and with the vaccine makers. We recruited college students, half of whom will get the vaccine, half of whom will not. And then they will swab themselves every day. And so then we'll really know whether the, the vaccine prevents transmission. I will say that real world evidence of what's going on in the UK and Israel does suggest that the vaccine possibly does play a role in reducing transmission as well. But this is all anecdotal. We just have to wait for the test results from the trial that Fred Hutch is running. We're hoping that we will have that data by the fall to sort of inform colleges what to do going forward. So what happens with these trials is there's multiple phases. So there's a phase one, a phase two, a phase three. The first one, you're just looking for a dose that works. Like you test a range of doses on a group of people to find the optimal dose. In phase two, you're doing safety and efficacy. You test more people to see how safe it is at that dose. And then you go to the big trial, which is the phase three. So that one, it recruits either 30,000 people or 45,000, depending on the thing. And the groups are split into at least two different subgroups, if not more. And half of them get the vaccine, half of them get the placebo. And they're monitored for illness. And basically, once a certain number of people get ill or report feeling ill, that's when they look and see of the people who got ill, how many got the vaccine, how many got the placebo. And based on that, that's where we get the efficacy numbers from. There have been variants since the start of the pandemic. There have been many different variants that existed. They become variants of concern or variants of interest. If you see a spike in a country and a, an increase in cases that is associated with one variant. The scary part about these variants is that the mutations occur in the spike protein, which is what a lot of the vaccines are targeting. So at least for Pfizer and Moderna, we don't truly know how they'll do against variants because when they were tested, we weren't talking about variants. They were tested summer of last year and there was no variant talk then. AstraZeneca, Johnson Johnson, Novavax, we do have a little bit more data because they have been in the field being tested against the variants when they were out there. I will also say that we have real world data, right? So the UK, the US and Israel have taken on really robust vaccination programs. And in all of those countries, B117 has been the dominant strain. And in all of those countries, we're now starting to see a reduction in cases. So that suggests that the vaccine is really good against B117. So we should be very hopeful here.